G'day, Richard. How's it going, mate? Good. How are you, buddy? I like all the oh. posters you got back. Yeah, man. Look, you know, it's my it's my sanctuary <laughs> where I'm at right now. You know, I reckon you and I, we, we go way back because I reckon you were projecting movies to me back in the day at the old uh, Hoyt Cinemas. <laughs> That's true. That that's a funny story. But yeah, I uh, I started uh, work at Forest Hill Chase ten. Yeah. When I was 15, 15 years old. That's where I, and I grew out. up in Box Hill. Far out, man. Like yeah, my side of town. But dude, you know, I remember going to see Mothman prophecies and Angel Eyes and things like that. You know, I reckoned you were the guy behind the behind the lamp. <laughs> I was. The, so thank yeah, you. I, it was one of my best. One of my favorite jobs when they still had projectionists. Um, yeah, totally. And you could still go in on a Wednesday night in Australia and and watch the fresh prints and make the adjustments. <laughs> and I did that the Nova as well. Um, yeah, cool. The Nova Cinema. The two of my favorite ever jobs. Yeah, I bet, man. I bet. So if you could go back in time, um, how would your younger self react if you told them that one day you'd be directing not only like a, a quasi sequel to Braveheart, but then following that up with a Western starring Gabrielle Byrne and Richard Dreyfus, amongst others? Surely he would be spun out. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. The, the steps are so small that you never really um, think about it like that. It's always... Uh, it's always the next step, and also being an indie filmmaker, where's where's the next job coming from? And then sure. you know, my family and I made the decision to move to LA, basically just so we could continue to make films, and that would be our thing. Um, I'd done a lot of the, the TV world in Australia, and I just wanted to make f- movies, and so it yeah, seemed sure. like that was the that was the best pathway if you wanted to make movies regularly enough to pay the rent. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, like, but, but add to that, like, you know, little steps, as you said, but you've ended up building your own bloody film ranch, dude. Like, you know, I'm going to talk about that soon, but like, you've got to be pinching yourself, surely. Yeah. We're in- incredibly fortunate. And the, the people that you meet, it's such a small world. Like, you know, when you're in the US, people are always like, oh, you're from Australia, you must know this person, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but it turns out in our industry, you usually do. And so yeah. they'll feel like an idiot saying to you, oh, you're from Melbourne, you must know this person, but you probably do. Um, and, or there's some, you look them up, it, it's such a tight little world. But yeah, incredibly fortunate. And I don't know why um, exactly that we've been drawn to Montana, um, but I've got a fair idea. Uh, but it's been a great, it's been a great move for us, and I'm in, I'm in love with it. And uh, I just, it's just a great state, and I just feel very comfortable here. Um, so it's cool. Yeah, awesome, man. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Montana and the film ranch soon. But like Murder at Yellowstone City, dude, what a, what a classic brand of western this is. How did this all come about? Right, so great script. So the guy that wrote Robert the Bruce, which is just a tiny little spin-off of Braveheart. It's got nothing to do with Braveheart. It's more like a kid's fable, but it was something that I was really passionate about, the story on. Uh, he wrote this Western, Eric, Eric, Eric Balgao, and he wanted to make a classic Western, but that hit, that hit on some really crucial subjects, but also was wrapped in a thriller. And I love that I idea of it um and i love the idea that it was a classic um western and i i read it and just fell in love with it and so we did, there's so many great westerns to draw upon um but when i was growing up like we had the more fun the fun style westerns that i would see with my dad um the Silverados um, and the Three Amigos and things that were the quick and the dead and these, these, these type of things. Right. Um, but my favorite Western's always been once upon a time um, in the West, just mm-hmm. Western's on epic proportion. And then we got lucky with, you know, films like the proposition in Australia, uh, Unforgiven here, Jesse James, 
more atmospheric type westerns mm-hmm. came in and then very dark westerns have come in so it was cool to read a script that was more classic um and that's what we it, it embraced with a fabulous cast and you're right you do pitch yourself when you're on set with um you know gabriel byrne uh, thomas jane richard dreyfus um, anna camp amy garcia the, the, these guys are uh brilliant and i've wanted to work yeah. with them for a long time so it was lovely that they felt the same way about the script. For sure. And you said that you, you embraced the genre. Like, with, Where was your mind at? Were you trying to hit certain tropes or were you trying to avoid various things? Or was it just sort of like, you know, just a bit of, bit of everything? Yeah, we, we, know, we knew we wanted to keep the photography classical, but we wanted to make it voyeuristic because we don't know who, who did it and everybody's looking at each other and everyone's judging each other. But we didn't want to be too showy with the camera. And then Westerns these days have become such a, a mashup in recent years um, that we just wanted to stay true to the characters and trying to paint scenes in a sitting, setting that felt uh, realistic to them. Mm-hmm. So whether it was uh, Isaiah or Cicero in his world, or it was Gabriel trying to keep the peace even at the cost of justice, or Thomas Jane and Anna Camp, that Anna, the women really drive the film. Um, uh, Tanea Beattie, who plays uh, Violet Running Horse, if it's not for her feeling something was wrong with the arrest, that leads mm-hmm. to Anna to know that she has to, she can't stand by it. She, they really push the dudes t- to step up. <laughs> yeah, and Amy totally. Garcia, who, who runs the town from the brothel, it, the, it was kind of powerful. that The women kind of decided that this was not right, that Isaiah uh, Cicero would be arrested. And they kind of, they, might, they make the push that it's, it's, it's not okay. And back then, if they're pretending to believe in God or they're believing in God, it wasn't okay to know that somebody was innocent and 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 just stand by mm, mm. yeah no that, that and that definitely like you said that's the crux of it and it um it is such a, an authentic kind of genre film as well like there, there's just something to it like may, maybe that's to do with the script or maybe it's to do with the fact that you did build this this entire city from scratch very real <laughs> it's not like you know it's not fake you know yeah, the, the um, city, it's funny because we, we sat there, you know, for three years building it. And so you were imagining, the, imagining it the whole time. Um, and the Yellowstone Film Ranch is just in such a beautiful spot on the river, um, just 30 minutes from Yellowstone. And uh, it, it was easy to imagine it. Usually when you're making um, a film, you don't get a lot of time on the, on the set and you're trying to fit a script into what you're given on the set. We, we had the opposite experience because we could build what the story calls for. Yeah. And I've been watching your social media presence for the last couple of years with the ranch and you just look like a kid in a milk bar with 20 bucks to spend, mate. Like you just like, <laughs> you look like you're in your element. Is that your paradise? <laughs> I, it is my paradise. I don't know why. Uh, my grandfather, uh, who I never met, grew up not far from here and was U.S. Army. And then met my mom in my grandmother in Melbourne. There's something about this area that I'm very close to, like Scotland um, and Ireland, where my family is from. I just feel very at home here. And getting out during the pandemic after being in L.A. for 11 years, it just the timing, we were very, very lucky. We got out just before the pandemic and to be in Montana where there's just so much space um, yeah. and very little lockdown. It, it, it was the perfect time to build <laughs> a Western town in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a good gig for all of these uh, players to be on, isn't it? When the pandemic hits, make a movie out in Montana. <laughs> I mean, and, and your cast, like you said before, all these ama- amazing people, even like Nat Wolf is in there, Isaiah Mustafa, and of course, Richard Dreyfus, amongst so many more. How the hell did you land such a big ensemble? Uh, probably the script, and definitely the script, and the fact that actors, 
most actors that I've met want to make a Western at some yeah. point <laughs> in their career. And the roles are so rich because usually it's a two-hander in a Western or a three-hander. You've got your bad guy and you've got your good guy and it's a revenge or whatever it is. But these supporting cast have huge roles. Um, Nat Wolf is a brilliant actor. Um, and it was just a bonus that he looks like he could be, he looks like Gabriel Burns. So they play a father or son that are struggling. Mm -hmm. And all these actors, Anna Camp and Garcia, Zach McGowan is just brings so much energy. Scotty Thompson that I've worked with many times before. Eric did a great job of, there's not a line of dialogue said by an actor unless that actor is going to get the payoff, which I found over the years is if, if you're going to say a line of dialogue, um, then we need to know who this person is. Otherwise, don't say it. Just yeah. don't give it to somebody that we do care about. And so the idea is that we would have enough build and tension so that when people start dying, you would care. And that wouldn't just be a big shootout and people are just dropping like flies. The idea would, would be, and it's not rocket science, obviously, but the idea would be that if we got to know them in the first hour of the film, then we would really care about them when something happens to them later. Yeah, right. For sure. Um, I'm, I'm a huge fan, as everyone is, of Richard Dreyfuss. Uh, having him on board, that's that, that must be a dream. I imagine him to be a joker. Is he? He is. Um, and he's a, an historian, so you've got to be on your toes. So when you go <laughs> into these first, phone, fo these first phone calls or these Zooms, um, you, you're nervous because <laughs> you're talking to Richard Dreyfus. And he asks yeah. you about your American history or where this was in Montana in 1881. You, you better be... You better be ready. Um, but he's a brilliant man, but he's a funny, funny guy. Um, but just so supportive. And every step of the way, he's checking in, how we're going, how we're doing, when, when's the premiere, what we're doing. Like, he wants to do more. He's got another Western that he wants to do with us. Um, he was one of those dream experiences um, that are rare when you get somebody with a body of work that you're just a fan of. Um, yep. but it's giving you the opportunity to, to do the best you can and, and direct it. And that was awesome. I bet. I bet. And for the benefit of people that are, that are listening or watching that, that aren't aware of what your Yellowstone Film Ranch is, can you give a bit of a breakdown and just explain why you built it and, and what practical uses you've put it to? Yeah. So, uh, came out here because I saw an Anthony Bourdain episode in Livingston, Montana. And I just went, I've got to, I've got to go there. But then when I Googled it again, he had done two episodes in Livingston, Montana. Uh, the first with the travel show channel and the second with the CNN, the, the latest series. I'm like, why did Anthony Bourdain come to Livingston, Montana? And then he's staying in Sam Peckinpah's room at the Murray Hotel. I'm like, I am going there. And so we were prepping another film on the East Coast and I just felt like I needed to come to Livingston, um, Montana. And it's just this perfect mix of old school cowboys, music, ranches and artists. Mm -hmm. A lot of phenomenal artists uh, here. And so we scouted all these Western towns in Santa Fe. So Westerns in the US, Westerns in the world get predominantly filmed in Calgary. Uh, if you want the Northwest, same backlots where they shoot Fargo TV show or um, Hell on Wheels or the new uh, Billy the Kid show. If you want the, the Northwest, it gets shot predominantly in Calgary. And if you want the desert these days, it gets shot in Santa Fe. And so there's a few towns there and a few towns in Calgary. So we're in Montana and a lot of these stories, whether it's Legends of the Fall or The Revenant or Dances with Wolves, a lot of them had parts of the film or a lot of the film that was set in Montana, but they would never be filmed in Montana. Um, so we decided that we would build, build a back lot so that those stories could be told here 
and so so also Canada is brilliant but when you make an indie film in Canada you can't bring your your crew and rightfully so you because you're getting their incentives and their benefits so if you go to Calgary you might get to take your DP and your first AD and that that might be it but over the years here over the last 10 years we have a crew um so shooting the film in the U.S is very uh, important to us. So we decided to build this Yellowstone Film Ranch um, uh, for all movies uh, and not just, not just our movie or Westerns. You know, you could make any survival film, any haunted house film here, any medieval film. And we, we made Robert the Bruce here. Mm -hmm. So uh, we shot in Scotland extensively as well, but it turns out that Montana looks almost identical to, to, to Scotland in the winter um, mm -hmm. to the point where people can't tell and Robert the Bruce where's, where's where, because there's nobody in Montana. There's 1 million people in the entire state. Um, so we found this fantastic spot um, with my uh, producing partner, Carter uh, Bain, and also the owner of a local hot springs. Um, we found this awesome spot uh, that has lodgings within five minutes. It's only a 45 minute drive from the airport and you're in paradise and you're only 30 minutes from Yellowstone Park. So that's a bit long way to describe how we got here, but that's how it happened. <laughs> no, well, it's, a, it's a great story. And I'm um, like, I've, I've been reading up on it. I've been on the website. It just looks like a glorious place, you know, interiors, exteriors, you know, stuff that's you know further away that you've decked out you know with huts and caves and stuff it's just exciting man i i love this kind of um this kind of story particularly when it's someone from home that's gone over there to to build something you know it's incredible thank you man it's it's a dream and a lot of people have come out like a lot of aussies a lot of my buddies um from way back a lot of aussie actors nick Farnell has been a partner helped me bring the ranch to life uh, anthony sharp there's half the team here that that helped make the ranch happen were Australians and I've worked all on all my previous films so there's a group here my longtime uh, production designer costume designer from England so Montana got a tax credit now 35 percent so now they're all able to kind of come here also the people that made the river runs through it and the horse whisperer and all those old Robert Redford crews that haven't been out of work here have, have now, have now come back because of the tax credit and that's how powerful it is when there's a, a decent incentive totally totally well exciting stuff that you're doing mate and something that occurred to me just before i let you go um so you mentioned before your your writing partner eric balgo um you two you know have a history that must be written in yellow because you made yellow brick dreams he made murder at the yellow brick road and now you make yellowstone so <laughs> And my company's Yellow Brick Films. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's nuts. That sort of stuff happens all the time. Um, I don't know why. Uh, it's it's just well, that's the dream, isn't it? It's a Yellow Brick Road. It's yeah. it's like trying try for something better, particularly when you're coming out of the eastern suburbs of Melbourne. <laughs> yeah, and watching all these brilliant films. We grew up in such a good time for movies. Mm, um, totally. You know, going to the Nova Cinema and going to the Tiamo and Nat Natalie Miller was a great, um, is a great mentor of mine. And we just grew up, grew up in a great movie watching mode. And the VCA, back when the film school was a film school, you know, when there was only yeah. a few kids learning to shoot on film, right, making three short films a year, then having to work on 10 other short films. Oh, lucky, lucky timing for me. Um, Damn straight. And Damn a straight. lot of, a lot of those guys from the class are all out there kicking butt. Um, and it's because we got to learn um, practically. Yep. Um, making films. Um, like when people you don't say you don't need film school, you don't. You just need the experience and the practical ability and to know what it feels like to fuck up somebody's sound and <laughs> then understand how important sound is and you won't do it again. Yep. Exactly <laughs> and right. if you don't, and if you're not the sound recorder or the focus puller or the clap loader, you might not have had the experience of what it feels like, and how important each position is. 
Um, and that was the beautiful thing about the VCA back in the day. Um, everybody's position was equally as important. And so we try to do, we try to keep that same philosophy. Awesome. I, I, I come from film school myself, so I completely relate to exactly everything you're saying there. Um, and a little bit of a throwback right before I do wrap this up with you, but, um, and I've loved chatting with you, by the way, but I used to own a video store and believe it or not, um, your first film, Summer Coda, was my manager's pick for a good 12 months on the shelf. So, <laughs> yeah, I absolutely I adored love, that I film. Love, when it came I love out. that film. It's funny, we're having the LA premiere of Murray Yellowstone City in the same theatre we premiered, premiered Summer Coda. It's loosely based on how my parents met and Mildura is where I got married. Um, yeah. And I, that was the best best time uh after project Greenlight, it took came second in that it took eight years to get that film up after coming second in project Greenlight, and i think that was the impetus to like get going making movies because i yeah, didn't want to wait damn straight another it's eight, a beautiful eight years. beautiful film such a good film i love it oh, yeah. thank you. but um appreciate thank it. you so much for um taking some time to chat i've um yeah, I'm loving your work, man, and I'm loving watching you on social media because you just the joy just comes out in those photos of the ranch. <laughs> Anytime, brother. You've got to come over here. <laughs> yeah, I'll, well, I'm probably in Canada next year, so maybe. Giddy up. Gold, which you all came here to find, brings you nothing but destruction and disaster. I want to get as far away from this place as I can. It is an evil place. You gotta quiet those hands. Come on. Don't let the violence unsettle you. This is my town. And these people, good or bad, are my people. What matters is law. And order. There's a fugitive. He, he killed people. I am innocent. That man, he left me his horse. How could he be the killer? How'd he get there with no horse? He's an innocent man. I'm gonna put this killer in the ground. I have no men like your sheriff. Too righteous to be right. Let me tell you about justice. Kill a man in this town. Everybody knows there's a price to be paid. Now, what about the truth? Kill all those men. You gotta do something, Pop. You're all murderers. Preacher! <gasps> what was that? A necessary end will come when, when it, it will come. come. Load up! Preacher! God. Drop it. So much for your divine grace. 